understand if you want. Okay. Thank you. I didn't have also my lunch, so I, I hope that I can have you time didn't for. Have lunch. No. <laughs> Anyway, so the uh, thank you for uh, for uh, for uh, for the invitation and for uh, the opportunity of discussing uh, some uh, uh, clinical uh, issue related to patients with EGFR mutations or patients with ALK rearrangement uh, in uh, no small cell lung cancer. It doesn't work. <coughs> If you can uh, adjust the. Okay, now it works. Okay, so this is uh, the current algorithm for the treatment of patients uh, with no small cell lung cancer. And uh, as you know, we need uh, certainly to stratify our patients uh, mainly according to the biology of the tumor. So the two most important. Uh, uh, biomarkers we are uh, using in our daily clinical practice uh, are represented by presence of EGFR mutations uh, or presence of uh, ALK rearrangement. In uh, presence of patients, uh, <coughs> thank you. In presence of patients with EGFR mutations, uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of data clearly confirming that EGFR TKIs, erlotinib, gefitinib, or afatinib represent the best option we can offer to the patients. And uh, in the group of patients with ALK rearrangement today, the only drug that we have approved for frontline therapy is represented by clizotinib. When we look at to the global number of patients with EGFR mutations and ALK rearrangement, they represent approximately 15% of our patients, meaning that unfortunately today we, have, we still have 85, 80, 85% 85 of patients in which we need to still offer chemotherapy. Probably even in this setting something is changing because we had uh, last Friday, a press release uh, from Merck announcing uh, that uh, pembrolizumab met the primary endpoint uh, of uh, survival in uh, a phase three randomized trial versus chemotherapy in patients uh, overexpressing PDL1. So probably in the scenario of uh, a frontline setting in the next future, we will have uh, immunotherapy and we still have uh, we are very curious to know what are the data with the details of the study with uh, pembrolizumab. Looking uh, to the group of patients with EGFR mutations, uh, we have uh, certainly many important clinical questions. And uh, one of these questions is uh, what is, for example, the role of liquid biopsy? What is the best drug? This is something that we have to manage every day. We have uh, representative from different companies coming knocking at our doors uh, saying that the drug they are selling is the best drug. So what is the best drug between erlotinib, gefitinib, or afatinib? Uh, another important question is the type of EGFR mutation is uh, if this is a relevant issue or not. How can we improve the results? Because uh, we know that patients respond very well, but unfortunately they progress uh, finally. So all these patients develop resistance. And uh, what are the options we can offer to the patient uh, at the time of progression? So the first question is, what is the role of liquid biopsy? Why we are so interested in liquid biopsy? Because uh, we need to perform in our patients uh, a lot of biomarkers, a lot of biological tests, and many times we don't have tissue available because it's in lung cancer particularly, it's very difficult to obtain material to analyze. Lung cancer is not breast cancer, unfortunately. In breast cancer, you have the surgeon providing you all the tissue that you want. In lung cancer, many times we don't have tissue. And it's very difficult to obtain tissue, a large amount of material. Now we know that also it's important probably to repeat biopsy during the time of the, during the treatment. So the liquid biopsy gives us the opportunity of obtaining uh, material from the blood, that is the circulating DNA, that we can analyze for uh, different biomarkers. 
the only limitation that we have uh, with this approach is represented by sensitivity that probably is not optimal. So sensitivity is around 60, 70 percent, irrespective of the method we are using uh, for uh, uh, analyzing the circulating DNA. At ASCO this year, we are presented some very nice data on uh, the possibility of detecting uh, uh, the T790M mutation, uh, that is the major mechanism of resistance uh, to first generation EGFRTKI in no small cell lung cancer, not only in plasma, but also in the urine. Uh, the the uh, header weekly presented the data with rosiletinib, and you can see here that irrespective of uh, the uh, method used for T790M detection, response rate with this drug was approximately 35%. So if a patient is positive in the tissue, in the plasma, or in the urine, response rate is uh, still the same, is approximately 35%, with a sensitivity that is uh, similar to what reported in our studies, in other studies, so approximately 80%. And even in terms of duration of response and progression-free survival, again, there is no difference irrespective of, of where the mutation was, uh, uh, was detected. These data are not the unique data that we have, because uh, during uh, the Geneva conference, the European Lung Cancer, Cancer Conference uh, last uh, April, uh, similar data with uh, osimertinib were presented. Osimertinib is another irreversible EGFR-TKI that is entering in our daily clinical practice, is already FDA approved for patients with acquired resistance to first generation EGFR-TKI. And what is important to note uh, is that if we have a patient that is uh, positive in the blood, the patient certainly is sensitive to the drug, but if the patient is negative in the blood and is positive in the tumor, again, we have a very good response to the treatment. So how this approach, uh, this information translate in our practice? In our practice, this information translate in the sense that uh, if we have a patient uh, in our clinic treated frontline with erlotinib, with gefitinib, or with afatinib, and this patient uh, after an initial response progress. So classically, this patient has what we define an acquired resistance. The first test probably we should offer to the patient is a liquid biopsy. If the patient is positive, we can start immediately, we can skip any biopsy and we can start a third generation EGFR-TKI, so simertinib. If the patient is negative, so only in the case the patient is negative, we need to repeat a biopsy. And if the patient is positive, at this point, we can offer again an EGFR-TKI. If he is negative, unfortunately, chemotherapy is the only option we can offer. So we have a very practical implication for our, for our practice from this uh, information. The other important point is uh, what is the best drug? And uh, we have three agents in our practice. Erlotinib, Gefitinib, and Afatinib. But at the present time, these are the three drugs we have. And of course, the practical question we have also during the morning session, uh, this uh, question has been uh, um, asked by, by, the, by the audience. Uh, how can we choose between these three agents? Well, we have today some uh, trials directly comparing these agents. So we can uh, have an answer about this question. This is a clinical trial that was published uh, this year in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, comparing uh, in, a in a second line setting in patients uh, not really selected for EGFR mutation, so in the general population of non-small cell lung cancer, comparing erlotinib versus gefitinib. And you can see here that in the general population, there is uh, no difference in terms of efficacy no difference in progression-free survival and overall survival. I guess it's really difficult to find any difference between the two curves. Even we have difficulties in distinguishing the colors of the two curves. And uh, also, there is no difference uh, even when we, con uh, when we <coughs> confine our observation to the group of patients with EGFR mutations. You can see here, no difference at all between EGFR mutant, uh, in EGFR mutant between erlotinib and gefitinib, but no difference according to the type of mutation, so the region 19 and the region 21. Why we think it's important to focus also the attention on the type of mutation? Because we had some uh, data last year 
suggesting at least that one of the drugs, afatinib, could be more, more effective in patients with deletion 19. So it's very important also to analyze the data coming from the ESMO Asia last December, reporting the direct comparison of afatinib versus gefitinib, the Lux Lung 7 trial. This is not a phase three trial. This is a phase two trial comparing the two drugs. So it's a, it's a smaller trial with a different the, 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 the statistical power. And in this trial, comparing afatinib versus gefitinib, there is a significant uh, improvement uh, in uh, progression-free survival favoring uh, afatinib versus gefitinib. But you can see here that the difference is uh, really modest and is uh, really marginal. So we have some small benefit in PFS, also not translating in any survival benefit. So there is no survival benefit in this, uh, in this trial. The difference are really marginal. I was, uh, when I saw this data, I was really curious to know if there is any difference in the trial according to the type of mutation. And again, you can see here, there is absolutely no difference in response or in progression-free survival between afatinib and gefitinib in patients with deletion 19, as well as in the group of patients with mutation in exon 21. So the message that we have from this trial is that technically, statistically, there is an improvement in PFS, but this benefit is really marginal, not translating in any survival difference. So, and also this is, a, I repeat, a phase two trial. So these data are not changing our standard of practice, are not able to induce us to give a preference for an inhibitor instead of another one. The only difference that we have between EGFR TKIs is the toxicity profile. Because uh, we have a toxicity that is a little bit different according to the type of inhibitor. With the diarrhea, that is the most frequent event we have uh, with uh, uh, afatinib. Uh, with afatinib also we have a skin rash, that also the typical side effects we have uh, with erlotinib. Also with gefitinib we can have some side effects. Generally people consider gefitinib uh, as the agent that is uh, better tolerated. Uh, the risk of a skin rash, the risk of diarrhea certainly is lower, uh, but also with gefitinib we can have some liver toxicity. Uh, elevation in transaminases is what has been observed frequently with this, uh, with this drug. So different drugs, similar efficacy, a, a little, some difference only in terms of the toxicity profile. How can we try to improve our results? Well, one of the uh, strategy that has been investigated more recently during the last years is the possibility of combining EGFR TKIs together with uh, uh, Bevacizumab, with Avastin. And these are the results of a clinical trial, a phase two randomized trial conducted in uh, Japan, uh, comparing uh, erlotinib Bevacizumab versus uh, erlotinib alone in patients with EGFR mutations. The results of this trial are quite impressive because uh, there is a significant uh, and very uh, relevant uh, improvement in progression-free survival favoring the group of patients receiving uh, the combination of erlotinib together with bevacizumab. But this is a very important information because uh, even if the majority of investigators was uh, convinced and uh, I uh, think are still convinced that we need uh, a confirmation in a phase three trial, the, the combination uh, received the EMA approval uh, at the end of April uh, of this year. So this is a combination we can also consider in our clinical practice. Um, there, are some, uh, there are two phase three trials currently ongoing, and one is uh, ongoing in Italy, that will uh, uh, are comparing uh, these two strategies, and uh, the, the results of this trial certainly will give us uh, more uh, uh, information and more uh, uh, details about the um, uh, potential superiority of the combination of erlotinib and bevacizumab in patients with no small cell lung cancer. All patients uh, or the vast majority of patients with EGFR mutation respond very well to the treatment, but unfortunately they develop resistance. And uh, we already know that the most uh, 
relevant mechanism of resistance is the occurrence of a secondary mutation in exon 20 of the EGFR gene, that is the T790M mutation. For uh, this uh, uh, mutation, we have uh, different agents that are currently under investigation. At the present time, the winner, so the agent uh, mo much more uh, promising uh, and uh, very close to the, uh, um, the, the availability in clinical practice is uh, osimertinib, tagriso. We have data clearly indicating that in patients with acquired resistance in T790M positive, response rate is approximately 60%, but also there is some efficacy in T790M negative because the response rate is approximately 20% that is not so bad, considering that the only option available for this patient should be chemotherapy. And uh, it's uh, important also to remember that even if the patient respond to osimertinib, these patients unfortunately are not definitely are not cured because uh, we still have the problem of acquired resistance even to osimertinib. The mechanism of resistance to osimertinib is different compared to the other inhibitors, but the, 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 the resistance occur again for a secondary mutation occurring in the binding site of the drug. So the typical event leading to resistance to osimertinib is this mutation, the C797S mutation, for which the patient became resistant to the drug. It's extremely important uh, to define uh, the mechanism of resistance to the drug, and probably the next future will be much more complex for our uh, biologists, for our molecular biologists, because uh, today, when we discuss about mechanism of resistance, we just ask to say if there is a, mut a secondary mutation or not, but probably in the next future, our bi biologists should also specify the exact location of the mutation. This is a very important paper that was published last year in uh, clinical cancer research, showing uh, that uh, when uh, this, uh, this is a model of patients uh, treated with uh, first-generation EGFR-TKI and then also with osimertinib. Well, uh, when the mutations uh, are uh, located uh, all in the same allele, the tumor is completely refractory to any treatment, while uh, when the uh, mutations uh, are not located in the same allele, the patient is uh, potentially sensitive to inhibition to first generation and third generation combination. So it's extremely important to define all the details of the resistance because in this way we can find the best treatment we can offer to our patients. So the strategy of treatment of patients is influenced also by these very relevant details. Moving from the EGFR setting to the ALK setting, the drug that we are using in our daily clinical practice currently is uh, crizotinib. Crizotinib received the approval in a second line setting uh, some years ago based uh, on the results of the Profile 1007 trial, a phase three trial comparing crizotinib versus chemotherapy, the standard second line chemotherapy, so pemetrexet or docetaxel. And the, the trial showed uh, a significant improvement uh, for the primary endpoint of progression-free survival for patients receiving crizotinib. So based on this data, the drug was approved in Europe for second-line setting. But uh, uh, more recently, uh, in, were uh, published uh, the data of another important trial, the profile 10 of 14, that is a phase three trial comparing crizotinib versus platinum-based chemotherapy and specifically platin uh, together with pemetrexet. So what we consider for ALK positive the best chemotherapy regimen, we consider the best chemotherapy regimen because uh, ALK positive patients are also more sensitive to pemetrexet. So in this trial, crizotinib was compared to the best chemotherapy regimen for ALK positive patients. And again, the trial was positive for the primary endpoint, progression-free survival, by showing a significant improvement in uh, progression-free survival for patients receiving uh, crizotinib. 
It's also important to analyze the toxicity profile of crizotinib because crizotinib is a very well tolerated drug. The toxicity profile is generally very favorable. When we look in general to the side effects, we have some side effects potentially relevant, for example, uh, hepatotoxicity, interstitial lung disease, but very rare. And some other effects, nausea, vomiting, visual disorders, that occur very frequently in the patient, but that are absolutely not relevant on our daily clinical practice. Uh, particularly, vision disorder is something that the vast majority of patients refer to the doctor, but is not something not really influencing the quality of life of the patient. Uh, the only the, the visual disorder consists generally in dark, in, in disturbed, in a dark adaptation. So what we generally suggest to the patient is just to pay attention during, uh, when driving uh, during the night. This is the only recommendation that we have. But this is something that has absolutely no impact on the normal life of the patient. Among the side effects, I just want to spend a few words uh, on uh, the possibility that patients treated with crizotinib could develop uh, renal cystis. This is important uh, for a very simple reason, because the renal cystis could be simple cystis or uh, multiple, very complex cystis. And importantly, they could be positive when we use PET scan. So if we perform uh, during the treatment with crizotinib a PET scan, there is a risk that we detect a positivity that is related to the occurrence of cystis and not to tumor progression. So we can uh, stop the treatment uh, but the patient is not really progressing to the therapy. So it, this is something that we need absolutely to consider in our practice, because uh, uh, the occurrence of cystis uh, is not so uncommon. Uh, this is something that we can uh, uh, detect, uh, detect uh, with some frequency in, uh, in our patients. What the scenario of the ALK positive patients is changing? Well, probably is changing, uh, and it's changing because of uh, the, uh, the uh, possibility that other drugs uh, could replace crizotinib in the next year. And uh, this possibility is, uh, was highlighted this year during the ASCO meeting. Uh, at the ASCO meeting were presented the data of the J-ALEX trial, that was a phase three trial comparing a new ALK inhibitor, alectinib versus crizotinib in Japanese patients. This trial with the PFS as primary endpoint showed a significant improvement in progression-free survival for patients receiving alectinib. You can see here there is a dramatic improvement produced by, by alectinib versus crizotinib. Also, the, uh, this is something that people working in colorectal cancer is very familiar. The deepness of response was... Uh, higher certainly in patients treated with alectinib than with crizotinib. And this difference in the deepness of response is certainly translated in this difference in progression-free survival. Also importantly, the benefit was particularly evident in the group of patients with brain metastasis as the baseline. Alectinib, in fact, is a very well-tolerated drug and also penetrates the blood-brain barrier. So it's a very potent against brain metastasis. And in fact, in this... Uh, small subgroup of patients, the hazard ratio was 0.08. So we had a 92% reduction in the risk of progression in this group of patients. So very impressive data. Of course, the question we have is, can we consider today alectinib the best therapy for frontline setting patients with ALK positive tumor? So the answer probably today is no, is no because uh, this is a trial conducted in only in Japanese patients, so we need a confirmation in Caucasian. And also importantly, we don't have at the present time any information on what was, were the treatment the patients received at the time of progression to alectinib. It's important to consider the strategy of sequencing of the agents, and we don't have this kind of information. And also we don't have at the present time any information about the survival data. So we need... A, Additional data before considering alectinib, the new standard of care in ALK rearranged tumor. But I think that these data are really, really 
um, is really is supporting the possibility that alectinib could become the new standard of care in patients with ALK positive tumor. Patient uh, responding to crizotinib finally progress. And again, the, uh, in the majority of cases, uh, progression is related to occurrence of a secondary mutation. So it's a similar story compared to EGFR mutation. The difference is that with EGFR TKI, we have mainly one mutation, the T79TM. For crizotinib, we have a lot of potential secondary mutations. And what is important is that for each of these mutations, we have a different sensitivity to the new inhibitors. And we have some uh, inhibitors that works very well in some mutation and some other that works better in other mutations. So it could be probably important in the next future, at the time of progression to, to uh, an ALK inhibitor, to repeat a tumor biopsy, to assess again the mutational status, and therefore to decide to give the, uh, op the, the optimal therapy for uh, patients uh, uh, progressing to the treatment. And here you can see the different drugs that we can co potentially give in presence of a particular mutation. I want to highlight this mutation specifically, the G1202R, that is a mutation for which all of the other agents are uh, uh, resistant except lorlatinib. Lorlatinib is a, a Pfizer compound that is a, uh, very, very interesting in terms, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, efficacy, and I'll show you some of the data. Here I show you, the, you some data in uh, patients with acquired resistance to crizotinib. The, uh, certainly we have evidence of efficacy with alectinib. Alectinib works very well in patients with acquired resistance to crizotinib, as well as seritinib, that is another drug. The problem for seritinib probably is that the tolerability is not optimal among the uh, different uh, ALK inhibitors, uh, probably seritinib is a little bit more toxic uh, than the other drugs. And then we have lorlatinib, that is a very potent uh, uh, ALK and also ROS1 inhibitor with the ability to cross, to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. At ASCO this year, we presented some uh, very exciting data showing uh, a very impressive activity in patients receiving even more than two previous uh, uh, ALK inhibitors, and also with an important activity in the group of patients with ROS1 rearrangement. The patients with ROS1 rearrangement are very sensitive to crizotinib, so when they progress, lorlatinib could represent a potential option we can offer to this patient. In Italy, we have a clinical trial at the present time ongoing with this compound. So in conclusion, we have for patients with EGFR mutations, many uh, different agents potentially available. Pro these agents are uh, equally effective with some difference only in terms uh, of toxicity profile with no difference also according to the type of mutation. At the present time, osimertinib is the most promising agent in patients with T79TM positive tumor and crizotinib for the ALK positive patients remain at the present time the standard of care, but we have other drugs, particularly alectinib, that could replace crizotinib in frontline setting if the additional data we are waiting will confirm the superiority of this agent. And what is important finally to remember is that these patients today receive many of these therapies in sequencing, and the best sequencing is still not well defined for our patients. The future clinical trial will allow us to well define exactly what is the best sequencing of treatment. Thank you.